Good day, I'm Hector Quinones, and I have the privilege of pastoring the Warwick Seventh-day Adventist Church, where we worship God. We're located at 92 South Road, here in beautiful Bermuda. If you ever have the chance, please come by, I'd love to meet you. This is our study series titled, Last Day Events. This is message number seven, the first angel's message. I invite you to get a Bible and get some writing instrument. And if you have any questions, please send them to me by email or here at our website, sdachurchwarwick.org or at our Facebook page, at Warwick SDA Church BDA. Now, if this is your first time with us, I'm going to encourage you, please, to listen to our previous messages as each one of our messages are built on the previous one. Okay? Let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, please anoint these lips, mind, and heart that the words that I say may be acceptable unto thee. Lord, you said that you would send us your Holy Spirit, that he would guide us into all truth. Oh, Father, here we are, seeking your guidance, seeking your direction. Lord, you said that if two or more would gather together, that you would be in with them to bless them. Well, Father, while we may not be together physically, we are together in purpose. So please, Lord, bless us now with your presence. Lord, please touch the ears of those who would hear your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Again, the first angel's message. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. And I remind you that Revelation is God's last day message to the last generation. While we don't know the day nor the hour of our Lord's coming, we do know this one thing. We do know that God always sends messages to prepare his people for culminating events, for cataclysmic events, for worldwide changing events. He does this because he loves us. He does this because he wants us to be prepared. Now, we shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't be astonished that Revelation points this out. We shouldn't be at all in any way think that this is something new, unusual. For example, if you just look at the book of Genesis, you'll see that the same thing was true. There was a man who preached for 120 years the same message. He said that water was going to come down on the earth and destroy all living creatures, and that the only way to be saved was to get into a boat. Now, to be sure, there must have been scoffers in those days. Why? Well, water did not come from down from the sky. Water came up from the earth. Read Genesis, you'll see. Therefore, I imagine people must have mocked Noah. I imagine people must have mocked Noah and his family. They must have said, this guy is off of his rocker. All of our scientists have all agreed that water doesn't come down, water comes up. As a matter of fact, they said that that's an impossibility. And I imagine that many other religious leaders must have said, no, no, don't worry about it. You are a child of God. I mean, you could trace down your lineage to Adam and Adam was the son of God. Therefore, he was the son of God. You're a son of God. You're once saved, always saved. And is it interesting that the Bible records that only eight individuals came into the ark? Only eight. And everybody else died? Isn't that sad? Is that not sad? Well, my point is this, my point is this. God always has messages, messages for his people. And those that are his people, as Jesus said, hear his voice. Now, if you care, read one of the epistles of Peter. According to the Holy Spirit through Peter and his epistles, he says that the same word that was used to preach about the flood is the same word that is used to preach about the end of the world with fire. And the book of Revelation reveals who that person is. You see, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And while sometimes it may be necessary for us to speak about what the beast is going to do, 
we need to remember that this message is not about him, it's about Christ. And Christ in his infinite love and mercy towards us is informing us of the plans of the devil and how God has preempted those plans and made those plans come to nothing. That's why in Revelation chapter 14, you find three angels. Interestingly enough, if you care, do a Bible study in Revelation chapter 16, and you'll see that the enemy also has three messages. They come in manner of three spirits. Therefore, Revelation is portraying the following to us, that as God is sending out his three angels to all the world, the beast, through the power of the dragon, is sending out his three messages to all the world. And each one of us is going to have to make a decision, which one are we going to listen? Let's study the first angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, verse six. Read along with me, please, if you will. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Allow me to break this up for you, please. Allow me to break this up for you. Did you notice? Has the everlasting gospel. Number one, number one, number one, let's handle gospel, gospel, gospel. What does gospel mean? It means good news. What is the good news? That God has not abandoned us to our sins. No. That we have power from God to have victory over anything that would destroy us, anything that would bring us down, anything that would seek to control us. God has given us power over the enemy. Praise God. Number two, it's everlasting. What does that mean? That means for every generation. And number two, it is for every world, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's for the world. It's great news for everybody and every generation. The gospel is the same. And what does God want us to know? He's on the move. He has taken every precaution, every necessary advancement in order to secure our salvation. And God is coming back. Yes, God is on the move. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and according to John chapter 14, God promises to return for us. He is not abandoning us here on this planet. We will one day go to heaven with him. My Bible tells me, I'm sure your Bible says the same thing. The dead in Christ will rise at that last day. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. Praise be to God. Now, Revelation also has some warnings. Such as what? Such as the false Christ, the false prophet, a false trinity. What did he say? Revelation chapter 16. A false system of worship. What did he say? Revelation chapter 13. A false lamb of God. Revelation chapter 13. A one world economic power. A one world military power. A one world judicial power. A one world system of governance. A time in where all of the kings of the earth give their power and authority unto the beast. Revelation chapter 17. All of this would cause us to wonder, why is God telling us this? Because he does not want us to be deceived. The Bible says that evil men will wax worse and worse, seeking whom to deceive. The Bible teaches us that in the last days, many people will be confused, such as people will be following different religions, thinking that they are all the same, such as Buddhism, Confucianism, and even the Quran, or even mixing theology, the study of God, with pseudoscience. Astronomy, astrology, 
thinking that in some way, in some form, in some shape, somehow the system of the planets have some control over your destiny. No, my brothers and sisters. The Bible says that in the last days there would be scoffers, people who would decry that the Bible was a lie. That the stories found in the Bible are nothing but myths. But you have studied with me about clay tablets that we found in today, Iraq, which used to be Babylon. We have studied how the events portrayed in the Bible actually had historical underpinnings. We know that from the Cyrus Cylinder. These are all things that we have studied to demonstrate that the Bible is accurate. That's why it's the everlasting gospel. The Bible says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. What does that mean? That means that whoever stands up and tries to undermine the veracity of the Bible will always be found to be a liar. Now, what is the event that God is trying to prepare us for? His second coming. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. The Bible says, read along with me. And I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Did you catch that? Notice verse 15. Take your sickle and reap. Now, I know we do not live in an agrarian society. I know many of you live in the cities. But you do understand the time of harvest, right? Harvest happens at the end. Harvest occurs when your crop, whatever crop that might be, is ripe. What is the illustration that God is trying to give us? Well, if you've studied Matthew chapter 13, you'll know that Jesus gave us a portrayal of the second coming in an illustration or a parable about some field workers. A, the owner, the king, the master of the house, went out and sowed good seed on his field. During the evening, an enemy came and sowed bad seed. During the time of the harvest, both came up, the weed and the tares. And the angels or the servants wanted to rip out the tares. The owner of the house said, do not do so, because if you do, you will destroy the wheat with them. Wait until the harvest when you can tell which is wheat and which are tares. And the wheat will put into our barn, but the tares will burn. The apostles came to Jesus and asked him, please explain it to us. Well, you can read it in Matthew chapter 13, verse 39, the explanation. Jesus says, the enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. What was Jesus speaking about? Jesus was speaking about the second coming. When Jesus returns, he comes for those that are his. Why are they his? Because he chose them? No. God chose everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever should not perish, but have everlasting life. Remember that? Whomsoever would believe on him, right? Amen? Okay, well, you have a choice. Maybe you choose not to. Well, then you made the choice. See, God made the initial choice. He chose the world. And as long as you're living on this planet, you're part of that decision. He chose everybody who's born and lives on this planet. You got that. Now the question is, what did you choose? So he comes to honor your decision. We're talking about the end of sin, my brothers and sisters. When Jesus returns, he's putting an end to all of this nonsense. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to a day that I don't have to worry about killer bees, killer wasps, 
or any type of killer disease. I don't know about you, but could we at least agree that we're looking for a time when we don't have to worry about insects or the food we eat or microscopic organisms? How about that? Well, that all happens when Christ returns. Now, somebody's asking, well, why doesn't it happen now? Simple. Because Christ hasn't returned yet. When he returns, he's coming to put an end to all of this. It's the end of sin in every way, shape, and form of its manifestation. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Let's look at that first angel's message. The Bible says, Then I saw another angel, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Number one, what is the everlasting gospel? According to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, the Bible says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Number one, Christ died for our sins. Again, John 3, 16, you know it so well. What does the Bible say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Number two, number two, number two, Christ lived a perfect life. Yes, Christ's perfect life record is put in place of the sinful record of all who accept him. See, it doesn't matter what you did in your past. What matters is what you do right now. Right now. You can't change your past. You can't go back. There is no such thing as a time ship. There is no such thing as a time device. You can't go back in time. But you can change your present. You can make a decision right now to change your present. And if you change your present, you can change your future. And that's what God wants you to know. He's willing to accept you right now, right here, right now, at this moment, and as if it were your first day. Today could be the first day of the rest of your life. And number three, number three, number three, Christ rose from the dead. Now, how does this and what does this have to do with anything about my past? Well, just as Christ rose from the dead, so you too can change your life. Whatever it is that has you bound, whatever it is that has you under control, whatever it is that has you under its thumb, Christ can give you the power to break free from. You do not have to be a slave to your proclivities. You do not have to be a slave to your tendencies. You do not have to be a slave to your vices. And you do not have to be a slave to your addictions. Your does not matter. It does not matter. It does not matter, my brothers and sisters, what your addiction is. It does not matter what your disease is. You with Christ, can break free from whatever the devil has you in its grasp. This is why it's the end of sin. And number four, number four, just as Christ ascended to the heavens to the Father, so too shall we. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. John chapter 14 and many other scripture verses, Jesus emphatically declares through his prophets or through his own words in red letters, he's coming again. That where he is, we may be also. The Father is going to send Jesus to meet us.
And the Bible says that we will rise from our graves if we have died in Christ. And if we have not died in Christ and we have remained alive and remained faithful, we together with those who have died in Christ will meet the Lord in the air and we shall be with him forever. Praise be to God. So what must I do? To be saved, it's simple. Look at the everlasting gospel because the everlasting gospel will tell you what you're supposed to do. The everlasting gospel will explain to you how to do it. And the everlasting gospel will explain to you why it's so critically important. Number one, what are we supposed to do? According to Revelation chapter 14, verse seven, we are to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? To fear God means that we should respect and reverence God by obeying Him. Revelation 14, 12, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now I know somebody's gonna say, ah, oh, you see, he's saved by works. He believes he's saved by works. When did I say I was saved by works? I know I'm saved by faith. The Bible says I'm saved by faith. I believe that. Do you believe it? Then we're in agreement. Uh, oh, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it. The issue isn't that I believe I'm saved by works and I have no faith. The issue is that I have faith enough to believe not only am I saved by it, but I also have the power to conquer the devil in my life. Yes, because Jesus gave me power over demons. And I don't care about the demons that are in other people. I need control over the demon that is in my life. God has given me victory over the demons that are trying to control my life. I believe that God has given me the power to live a Christ-centered life before Him on this planet. I don't need to carry a Bible to prove that I'm a Christian. I don't need to carry a cross to prove that I'm a Christian. I People just by looking at me and by hearing how I talk and by seeing how I conduct my life will be convinced that I am a Christian. Yes, there was a time when I was not acting as a Christian and they can remember that, but praise be to God, they can't say that the old Hector is still the same Hector today. No, there was a Hector before Christ and there is a Hector after Christ. Is there a Christ before in your life? Or is Christ present in your life? Are you still that same person that Christ found? Or has there been a change in your life? See, the angel, the angel says, fear God. What does that mean? That means that we should reverence God. What, a, what other message does that first angel have? It says, he says, give God. Glory to Him. Now, I know it's easy for us to start singing praises and glory to God and live a lifestyle that belies that songs, those songs that we were singing. I, I, I know that it's possible. I know it's possible to be one person in church and another person out of church. But doesn't giving glory to God entail more than just a few hours or a few minutes in church? Shouldn't it entail my entire lifestyle? This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, the message of the second angel tells us whom we should worship, why we should worship, and how we should worship him. Now, why should we do this? Why should we worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water? Because he is the creator. We should worship the creator and the creator alone. Pastor, why are you making an emphasis about this? Haven't you read Revelation 13? That there is an individual. There is a beast-like person. There is a beast-like entity that will rule on this planet in the last days, and it's coming so soon, and he's going to want our worship, and people believing that they're worshiping God will actually worship him. 
The Bible is warning us, is informing us that we should worship the Creator. Revelation 4, 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you, what? Created all things, and by your will they exist and were, what? Created. We're not talking about Big Bang. We're talking about God said, let it be, and it was. We believe that God created this planet in six literal days, and on the seventh, he rested. Why? Because his word says so. And if he is able to do that, what can he not do? The Bible says that we are to worship the creator God. Please observe, Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, is a warning against worshiping the beast. And Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, is an advice, admonition, information, a warning to worship the Creator. Which one of the two are you going to worship? Number three, why is this so critically important? Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, the first angel says, the hour of his judgment has come. Now, we do not know the day nor the hour of Christ's coming, but we do know that everybody will have to stand and give an account unto the Lord. The question is, are you ready for that? Now, you don't know the day nor the hour of his coming, but you also don't know when is your last day. When will you breathe your last? We're living in interesting times. Now we have giant hornets, giant bees, killer bees. Bees that have come from overseas here into America. Bees that are attacking us. We have issues with our food. We have issues with germs. We have issues with animals. What's going on? The Bible is clear. These are all signs of the second coming of Christ. And while we know not the day nor the hour, we do know that there will come a day when we shall all stand before God. Are you ready? Are you ready for that judgment? Are you ready to hear God's verdict? God's verdict is going to be really simple. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. He's going to tell you what you decided is it, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his what? Works. Not saved by works, saved by faith. But did you have enough faith to believe that Jesus could change your life? Not saved by works, but by faith. But did you have enough faith to believe that Christ could give you the victory over those things that want to control you? You're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. But did you have enough faith to believe that just as Jesus lived on this planet, you could live too? See, the beast wants to confuse you. The beast is going to have his own system of worship. The beast is going to have his own doctrine. The beast is going to have his own church but God will have his too. That's why Revelation 14, the first angel's message is a warning. It's a warning not to close your ear to the everlasting gospel because the message of the first angel is a call to accept the everlasting gospel, the truth that God loves you. God loves you so much. He wants to save you. Not only save you from your past, but save you from the future save you from the horrible future that you're looking at. God wants to do that, but you have to accept him today. The everlasting gospel is a call that God can give you the power to live an obedient life. Right now you feel powerless. Right now you feel hopeless. Right now you feel impotent, but God can put in you a new spirit. Right now, right now, right now, your past might be something horrible, but the everlasting gospel is a call, a call, a call to give glory to God in all of your life, in every aspect of your life. Right now, God can give you the victory in every area of your life, and it is a call to worship Him. 
You've been worshiping many other things. Many other things have been vying for your time. Many other things you have thought were important and you have realized that they are not important. This is a call to worship God. And the Bible says it's an urgent call to receive Christ into your life before the last light of the earth dims. This is your opportunity, my brothers and my sisters. This is your opportunity to accept Christ. Understand this, that the angels in heaven are going to say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And there will be a group of people in the last days ready to accept Christ. My question to you right now today is, will that be you? It could be you. Right now, you can accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Right now, you could accept Jesus and his gospel. Right now, this very instant, won't you do so? Won't you? Would you please bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Father God, please, please, Father, accept my yes and accept my past. And I accept your future. And I accept your power. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have made that prayer or one similar, won't you please contact me? You have my email. You have my website. Please contact me. God bless you. My name is Hector Quinones.